about you, but I want to focus on the good of 2020. How good was God was for us? I don't know, but God has been super, super good this year for me. You know, I sat last night. It's good to jot things down, isn't it? And I sat down last night and I was jotting down some of the things that the Lord did and worked for me this year. Man, I, I don't know if I share some of this stuff, but I was like, God, you are good. Amen. You are so faithful. Amen. Regardless of where anybody says, oh, 2020 has been such a horrible year. Well, you know what? For us Christians, God has been amazing, hasn't he? Hallelujah. Hasn't he been good? I mean, I just writing down some of the things that God has done in my life this year. And I just began to like cry, like, Lord, you have been so good and so faithful. So I challenge you, church, if you think 2020 has been a bad year, sit down and talk to the Lord and let him remind you of all the things he has done for you. Yes, amen? Amen, amen? Yes, thank you, Lord. So anyway, with that, I'm going to focus on the good of 2020 and start the year on the right, right path. Amen? Amen. God has been with us in 2020. Yes. Amen. He's been working in our lives yes. in a mighty, mighty way, even when we don't notice it. He has been speaking through us to people, ministering. Amen. Delivering his word everywhere that we go. We shine. Hallelujah. We're supposed to shine. Hallelujah. Amen. We are the light of this world. So everywhere that we go in, we bring Jesus with us. Hope, right? Love and joy and peace. Yes. Sometimes people are going through some crazy day and we come in into their midst and then it all is well. Yes. You know, because we'll be able to like talk to them and say God is good. Amen. And give them some hope in Jesus. Amen. Yes. That's what we're here. If we're not doing that, we need to wake up. Amen. Yes. Let this year of 2021 be a good year. Amen. Amen. So our challenge is to make a list of all the good things God done for you on 2020. Right? Amen. Um, you know, he, as we approach the year, let us focus on the great future and God's plans for you and I. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Yes. Amen. Plans to give you, uh, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Yes. Plans to give you a hope and a future, a great future ahead for 2021. Amen? Amen. Amen. So God has great plans for us for 2021. Amen. God is doing a new thing. Yes. I sense it. I feel it in my spirit starting today. He's doing a good and a new thing. Amen. Yes. Isaiah 43, 18, 19 says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Hallelujah. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I perceive it this morning. How about you? Yes, I'm ready to start dancing. Well, we did a little bit, didn't we? We got to keep afterwards we can dance. I'm making a way in the wastelands. He is making a way where there seems to be no way. When you're sometimes in a situation, he says, I don't know how God is going to do it. But... You notice that he always comes through? Yes. Look back and, you know, the year, how he came through for you. Those are the things we need to hang, hang on to when we're going through difficulties, what God has done for us in the past. You know, he always reminds me, Ellie, remember this? Remember that? I was like, yes, Lord, and I get all excited, you know, when I'm down. Remember the things that God did for me. Amen. So God is with us in the new year, and we need not to worry about anything. We need to focus on him. Amen, like Sarah said last week. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Because when we fix our eyes on the Lord, everything's good. Amen. 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 Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto us. Sometimes we get it twisted and we're after all these things. But the word says in Matthew, Seek him first and his righteousness. Let us not get busy and focus on the things that we're lacking or we don't have. Let us focus on Jesus. Yes, because if we put him first, he's going to take care of the rest. Amen? Amen. 
He has done it for us, and he still will, and he's with us, and he's got us in the palm of his right hand. What better place to be than in the palm of God on his right hand? Amen? He covers us with his feathers, and he protects us. Amen? He provides for us, and he guides us with the Holy Spirit. Are we listening to the Holy Spirit? Huh? Are we getting quiet before him so we can hear what he's saying? You know, I always pray, Father, give me eyes to see and ears to hear your word and a heart to receive you. Because sometimes I get so busy and I'm like, Ellie, I'm talking to you. I'm giving you the answers, but you got to be still. Be still in my presence so that you can hear my still small voice. Amen. So let's do that in 2021. Spend time in his presence so we can hear when he's directing us. Amen. And, uh, you know, I hear a lot of people say, Oh, I need to pray about that. I need to, and yes, we need to pray about things. This is for somebody. I don't know who, but I take it because it's not in my notes. You know, it's like the Lord says, buy somebody a coffee. And you're like, is this your Lord? Do I need to pray about it? No, you don't need to pray about buying somebody a cup of coffee. Just do it. Be obedient. I don't know who this is for, <laughs> but take it because it's for free. Buy that person that, that cup of coffee. Make their day because you don't know how you're ministering to them. You know, I, I'm going to share this story because it's coming to my mind, so I guess it's meant for me to share it. I was, I, it was about probably seven years, eight years ago, and I was on my way to church, and I stopped to get a cup of coffee at the gasoline station. And um, as I was coming in, there's this woman in this fancy car. I don't even know what it was because I never even seen that model. I think Jack Wire or some, something expensive. You know, she's coming out with this trench long mink coat and beautiful and all accessorized and gold and silver and diamonds everywhere she's coming into the gasoline station to buy a cup of coffee and she's getting the coffee before me and 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 she's ahead and the lord says buy her no she's behind me and she says buy her coffee and i'm like what <laughs> buy her coffee did you just not see what car she got out of father i mean hello this woman should be buying me a coffee right and I said, okay, yes, Lord, I'll do it. I was just growing with the Lord that back then. I was still learning. And so I bought, and I went to pay for my coffee. And I said, yeah, my coffee and then hers. And she just smiled. And then she got, began to get a little tear in her eye. And she goes, I think nobody's ever bought me a coffee before. And I don't know what she was going through, but I think it was something difficult. And just my act of obedience to buy this woman a coffee spoke loud to her. So buy that person a coffee. Don't got to pray about it. Amen. Amen. So let us move forward in 2021. Let's seek God like never before and expect him to do great things. Amen. Because, because if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. So this morning, today we have the pleasure to have Mike and Linda uh, living good with us. It has frequently been reported that their meetings carry an unusual manifest presence of God. I don't know, but I'm already feeling it as soon as they walked in the door. Amen. When we were worshiping, his presence was so heavy. I thought I was going to be slaying the spirit right where I was standing there. You know, often, often it's been, it's been easy for people to get saved, healed, filled with the spirit. Amen. I hope you came expecting because it's going to be so, so good. Amen. Today, we expect lives to radically change by an encounter with the manifest presence of God. Yes. I think we already have been encountering, right? So thank you for coming to bless our church, yes. family, and our city. Amen. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Ellie, and good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Harley and Pastor Karen, for the invitation. Uh, my wife and I, a few weeks ago, had, uh, because of uh, COVID, we were on a schedule change. I know none of you have experienced <laughs> anything, you know, with schedule changes in the last year. But uh, uh, according to my schedule, I was somewhere in another part of the world. And uh, COVID just kind of rearranged things. And, uh, and so we uh, had the opportunity to slip on on a Sunday night. You had a guest speaker here that I uh, knew. And, uh, and I found out he was going to be in the area, so I thought, well, I'm just going to drive up and slip in the service. And afterwards, when I got a little bit of uh, refreshment, 
fellowship with your pastor and his wife and, and a few others who were there. It had a great evening. And since then, we've had uh, brunch with your pastor and wife, just beginning to get to know them and to build a bit of a relationship. And so it's a real joy for, for us to, to be with you today. Uh, there is a resource table with some books at the back. I think I'll wait and say something about that perhaps later. I, I want to get right um, to the message this morning, if I may. And Ellie, for whatever this is worth for you, um, two of the passages of Scripture that you were referencing are in the context of what I have in front of me. And just for whatever that's worth, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, uh, it says, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. And then in Jeremiah 29, the 13th verse, which follows the verse that you're reading, says, you shall seek me and find me Amen. when you search for me with all your heart. And then uh, I'd like to read Psalm 118, and maybe I'll have you stand with me for just a moment. Uh, Psalm 118 and verse 17, and uh, this is uh, from versions of the Bible in basic English. It says, life and not death will be my part, and I will give out the story of the works of the Lord. And then in the 143rd Psalm, the 8th verse of the 143rd Psalm, again of the Bible in basic English, let the story of your mercy come to me in the morning. My hope is in you. Give me knowledge of the way in which I am to go, for my soul is lifted up to you. I'm going to invite you to pray a little prayer with me, if you would, whether you're here in the auditorium or you are watching us via YouTube. I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me today. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, open my heart, open my heart, that I may hear, that I may hear what you would say to me. What you would say to me. Change my life. Change my life. Make me more like Jesus. Make me more like Jesus. In his precious name. In his precious name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. It's a line out of scripture where one of God's people says to another group, come and go with us. We'll do you good. And that's the theme that I want to deal with this morning. The message is going to be something that I'm a little bit uncomfortable when I share along this line. But I'm going to, I'm going to welcome you to go with me on a bit of the journey of, of our past, where we have been and where we are journeying through. I felt like I should walk with you through a portion of our story, a portion of the things that we have uh, experienced over the last number of years. Now, I have a certain uneasiness in doing that. Number one, because I feel very strongly about the importance of the preaching of the Scripture. And in fact, I have been saying to my wife that I'm finding myself a little bit frustrated because I am seeing so many things uh, from the Word of God that in this season that uh, we have been uh, forced uh, to do more uh, inner court ministry than outer court ministry, that I am seeing so many things in the scripture that I'm saying, Lord, I, I want to share that. And, and there just is more op there's more things to share from the word of God than there's opportunity to share them. And so part of me says, man, I really want to share from, from the scripture, but I, I just have a sense that I need to share this. I, I want Jesus to be the emphasis, and I'm always aware, when you begin to tell your own story, you can subtly make yourself to be the center of the story. And as much as is possible, I don't want that to take place. I want this to be the story of what he is doing. It's his story in our lives. Now, I'm sharing this story for the following reasons. I've had a nudge from the Holy Spirit for a few weeks now that I should actually do this this morning. And so when I received a note several days ago from the pastor asking if there was a sense of, of a title uh, that I could give. I thought, my first thought was, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know? I, I tend to be one of those guys that, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in an auditorium saying, Lord, you do recognize uh, that one of us is supposed to be speaking in a few minutes. And it would be good if you would kind of cue me in 
you know, and what it is you would like me to, to speak about. But I did actually have this sense of direction, and, and so I said, just kind of share that. Come and go with me. It's going to do you good. Because there are things that the Lord has done in our lives, that if He will do those type of things in your lives, it will be good. If He will do those type of things in your church, in your family, that your story will be, come and go with me, because it will do you good to follow on this journey. Uh, I, uh, I also give us an opportunity to get a bit acquainted with each other. Now, I have a personal fondness for the, uh, the unnamed prophet. Uh, there are time to time the scripture says a certain unnamed prophet came and delivered a message. And we don't know who it was. Scripture never tells us who it was. Just showed up, delivered a word from the Lord, and rode off into the sunset. And I have a certain fondness for that motif where it's not about the messenger, but it's about the message. Amen. But at the same time, I recognize that most of the time, it does us good to have some point that we can relate to, some connect point that's there that, uh, that, that helps us on the journey. And, and then I hope that this story will build hunger and will build thirst in your heart whether you're in the auditorium or you are watching online, that, that as I share with you some of the things that were a part of our journey, that it will be not only a, a sense of connection, but a sense of encouragement. That you will say, God, if you did that for them, then maybe you will do something for me. Uh, I'm going to pause a moment and, and inter, interject a story that's not in my notes. So I, again, Ellie, I, I relate to, to you. Uh, <laughs> And that's always dangerous because you know, try to get everything in in, in certain you know, reasonable time frame. It's like stick to your notes. But we were invited to go to the nation of the Philippines to speak. A missionary there invited us to come and to, and to speak at a conference. And just about 10 days before we were to go, I, I received a communication from that missionary. And he said, you need to speak with Pastor so-and-so who has just returned from the Philippines, uh, and he needs to talk with you so you have some sense uh, of what it is you're about to walk into. Okay, so I, I called that pastor. He said, yeah, we need to talk. He said, but we need to make an appointment because this is going to take me at least an hour to share with you. Now, I got to know that man. Well, really, an hour, that's a short phone call. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, but I, I, we set a time frame and we began to speak. And he began to share with me some of the things they had experienced uh, while they were in the Philippines. And in one particular city that they were preaching, and something like close to 10% of the population of the city responded to a salvation invitation. And so I'm listening to these stories. He's talking about his 10-year-old son uh, walking up to somebody uh, who's in a wheelchair and just saying uh, in the name of Jesus and grabbing the man by the hand and pulling them out of the wheelchair. And, and he's going off of these incredible stories and I'm listening and I'm, I'm having two reactions. Part of me is going, wow, awesome. That's incredible. And a part of me is going, oh, no. Why would you say, oh, no? Because I'm thinking to myself, I'm going over there next. <laughs> and they are going to expect me to do what he did. And I said, Lord, uh, I don't have that type of anointing. That's not normally the way that you use me. And in fact, I said, Lord, I've got, I've got really a great idea. Why don't you send him back? <laughs> he can go back over there and he can preach the meetings I was going to preach and I'll stay here in the States and I'll preach the meetings he was going to preach here it's a win-win the Lord did not seem overly impressed with my idea I don't know about you I've got a lot of ideas I think are great but God doesn't seem to be overly impressed with them and so I said Lord why am I going anyway? Now, a teenager said that God answers prayer three ways. Yes, no, and uh, you've got to be kidding. 
Did you ever pray one of those prayers? Did you ever feel that some angel in heaven is scratching his head and saying, what was that about? You know, what in the world? But, but I said, Lord, why am I going? And God answered me. And he said, because you are so average. No, it gets worse. <laughs> and when you get there, I want you to tell them that. <laughs> yeah, right. I, you want me to tell them that we just brought a speaker in from the other side of the world, and we brought him here from the other side of the world to speak to this event, and he's average. <laughs> and they said... I want you to tell them that what they're going to see while you're there is what they're going to see after you're gone. Because it's not about you. It's about me. Now, I will tell you, when the Lord told me that I was average, I was stunned, to be honest. I, I, I was like... You know, okay, Lord, I didn't have to be number one, you know, but, you know, could I, like, you know, top 25% or something? <laughs> and and, and I, I, just, I walked into the auditorium to the service that, and I still just kind of sort this out, you know, average? Now, I, I will tell you this, as I look back on it, probably one of the most incredibly liberating things the Lord ever said to me was, you're average. Because when the God of the universe tells you that you're average, guess what? You're average. It's like he said, I just checked out the entire universe and yeah, you're about average. Which meant I could quit performing. Because God already told me who I was. And I was average. Now the good news is that which God can do with that which is average. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won't give you all the stories of that week, but I'm going to give you a couple. Uh, we, we saw some phenomenal things. This was a, supposed to be a preacher's gathering and uh, that I was preaching, and they told me I had about 1,500, 2,000 people. And, and in the course of, of the five days, we saw something like 1,700 people respond to a salvation altar call. Uh, we saw 300 conservative count, their count, baptized in the Holy Spirit in one evening. And uh, so we just saw God do some incredible, incredible God stuff while, while we were in that particular meeting. I, I do have to tell you this story. It was the third night. And uh, the first night was, was dead. And the second night was worse. And the third night was following the same pathway. And they had sang one congregational song, read the poorly, and then the choir had sang. And I know evangelists have a reputation for stretching things, but you can check with my wife and she will verify this. The choir was worse than the congregation. <laughs> arguably, arguably it was the worst choir I've ever heard sing in my life. And any of my friends in the Philippines who are watching, my apologies. But it, it was just not a good choir. And uh, they finished singing, and the moderator of the meeting then stood up and introduced me and said, we have brought the speaker from the other side of the world. We want to give him plenty of time, and he's given me the service. And I'm thinking to myself and saying to the Lord, uh, it's not ready. <laughs> this service is deader than a door now. It's worse than the last two nights. What am I going to do with this thing? I don't want the microphone. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm wandering over to the pulpit thinking, what am I going to do with this thing? And, and I get this little impression from the Holy Spirit. He said, just have them stand up and worship me. Now, that's not particularly profound. So I said something like this, you know, for a bird to fly, it takes two wings. That really a deep theology there. And I said, and for this service to fly, it's going to take the wing of the Word of God and the wing of worship. And in a moment, I'm going to preach the Word of God, but would you stand with me? 
And could we lift our hands and could we lift our voices and begin to worship the Lord? And they tried. Did you ever notice, gentlemen, that you can work all day long, driving nails, hands above your head, and you're fine, but step into the house of God, lift your hands and worship, and who put the two-ton weights on your arms? <laughs> and these friends, they were trying, but in about three minutes, it's going absolutely nowhere. And I don't have any other clue what to do. And so I said this, can we... Uh, can we extend it a minute longer? And in that next 60 seconds, my wife was sitting off on my uh, right and the left side of the auditorium. She said it was like a wind came down the stairway that went out of that tent up to the side of that mountain to the road above the tent. She said it was like a wind came down and hit right there. And that area suddenly erupted in worship. And then suddenly in the back left of the tent, and then on that side, and then here, and then. And for the next 25 minutes, I stood there with the microphone in my hand saying nothing, just watching. Eruptions taking place throughout that tent as the Spirit of God was just swirling. And then at the close of that roughly 20, 25 minutes, I heard the Spirit say to me, now give the salvation altar call. And I explained to the Lord I had not preached yet. <laughs> just in case he had not noticed that. <laughs> and uh, he said, give the altar call. And I said, uh, Lord, you remember two wings, bird, uh, and give the altar call. Uh, Lord, uh, the guy in charge said I was going to preach. And uh, he doesn't like Americans. And he's hard to work with. And I want to be submitted to him. And the Spirit said, Give the altar call. Have you ever tried to have an argument with God? <laughs> if you've never done that, let me save you some exasperating times, okay? You, you never win one of those things. And so seeing he was not changing his mind, I gave an altar call. Something like this. There are those under this tent that you do not know the Lord. You know, you're not giving your life to Him. There's some under this tent that you used to know Him. You're away from Him. You're doing things that Jesus would never do. And we're not waiting any longer in the service, but right now. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and come to the front. Now, the night before, I'd give an altar call, like 20, 25 people responded. This night, I gave that invitation. I counted 400. The missionary counted 600 people that began to run from their seats to the front of that building. And then God began to give me words of knowledge concerning the types of sin that were in that tent. And, and, and I'm, this is a preacher's gather. I'm hearing this word from the Lord about people who are selling drugs. Not doing drugs, selling drugs. And two or three young men in the back of the tent broke and ran to the front and, and committed their life to Jesus. And then, and, then, and then all heaven just continued to break loose. And, and before the night was over, something like uh, 300 people got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it was, it was a phenomenal time. But I stood in, and I knew there was things that were awesome that God did that week. The, uh, a, a friend that we took with us said to me later, he said, that was the most incredible week of my life to be there during that particular thing and to watch what it was that God did. And, uh, but last year, I was back in that area again. I've been back there many, many times since then to preach. And I was speaking at one of the conferences again, and my interpreter said to me, I need to tell you a story. Because I've been meaning to tell you this story for many years, but this is really the first opportunity I've had alone with you to tell you this story. He said, you may, he said, I want you to know this. He said, the very first conference that you spoke at here in, in this region, that conference changed my life. He said, the very first night changed my life. I remember that first night. It was so dead. He said, you preached about being hungry for God. I said, I remember that. He said, the close of the service, I said to the Lord, Lord, would you give me the hunger that I see tonight in that preacher? God, would you put into my heart what you have put into his heart? He said, that became my prayer 
for the next 20 months of my life. God, would you put into my heart the hunger that I saw that night in the heart of that preacher. He said, 20 months into that prayer, I had an encounter with the presence of the Lord in my home. It changed everything in my life. He goes, I recognize. He goes, that. He said, the night that I first prayed that, he said, I was just out of Bible college. I was pastoring my first church, and I was in way in over my head. I did not know what to do. But something that night and the hunger that God put inside of me and has changed my life. You see, God said, you're just average. But tell them that what they're going to see, what they're going to experience is what they will see and experience in the days that are before them. You see, the testimony has always played a significant role in moves of God. In Revelation 12, 11, the word of their testimony was a part of the secret of their overcoming the accuser. It was Moses who said to his father-in-law, Come thou with us, and we will do thee good. Paul was set for the defense of the gospel in Philippians 1 and 17. And an amplified uh, version of Philippians 1 and 19, he talks about it was avails for the saving work of the gospel. I'm going to give at the close of the message, after um, everything begins to move in that direction, And we'll have a time of praying for those who are watching online and then praying for those here in this auditorium. But there will be two invitations given. I will give an invitation for those who have never given their lives to Jesus. You may be in this room and you've never given your life to the Lord. I was just a few weeks ago preaching in a church uh, and there were several that responded to the invitation at the end. And that week uh, I received a communication from a gentleman who said, I've been going to church uh, for 27 years. And he said, and this Sunday morning as you were preaching, for the first time I really understood the gospel For the first time, I grasped what it was uh, that I was personally a sinner away from God, that my sin had offended a holy God, but that God loved me and He wanted my sin to be forgiven. And He said, on that Sunday morning, I gave my life to Jesus after 27 years in church. I've learned not to assume anything. I was preaching one Sunday morning in Canada and I finished the message and gave the invitation and the Spirit said, give it again. He said that six times. So I gave the altar call for salvation six times. Every time another group came from the seats to the front, on that sixth invitation, the pastor's wife left her seat and came and collapsed in a heap at my feet and nobody came anywhere near her. They did not know what to do. I wasn't really sure exactly what to do. But after the service, she said to me, now you have a story of a pastor's wife getting saved. The background was this. Uh, Her husband, who was the pastor of the church, his first wife uh, had died of cancer a few years before. This lady was working in the offices of another church in the city. And he met her while he was in that church on business. They struck up a friendship. It led into a dating relationship. It led into falling in love. It led to marriage. And he had always assumed, because she was a good woman, she was a religious woman. But on that Sunday morning, it it dawned on her that while she was good and while she was religious she was not in a relationship with Jesus Christ so that afternoon I called my wife normally my wife is always with me but that particular trip uh, I had flown from a revival that we were preaching in in, in the central part of the U.S. had flown up to Canada just for the Sunday preached and flew back and I said to my wife you'll never believe what happened this morning in the service and I shared with her she said I'm not surprised She said, when we were there last time, she was in conversation with that dear lady. I knew there was something that wasn't quite right. So I've learned not to assume. You may be in this building, you may be watching online, and you have never given your life to Jesus, but today you're going to sense the Holy Spirit saying, would you come and go with me? Because if you will, it will do you good. It may be that you once were on a journey with the Lord and something happened. Maybe you got hurt in church. By the way, if you have never been hurt in church, can I prophesy over you? (laughs) 
It will be accurate. I promise you. But there are those, and, and over the years when people said to me, well, you know, I used to go to church. And I would say to them, how'd you get hurt? Had them look at me and say, how'd you know that? Are you a prophet? I said, no, actually, I'm becoming an old man. <laughs> and I've just been around a while, and what I've discovered is Jesus doesn't hurt people. And I've yet to have somebody who has backstood away from the Lord say to me that Jesus hurt me. But I've had many, many, many of them who said to me, I got hurt in church. Somebody said something. Somebody did something. Something happened in the, in the church relationship. And they became hurt over that which took place. And Jesus got the blame for what his siblings did. May I encourage you not to blame Jesus for what his brothers or sisters do? Any more than you want to be blamed for what your brothers and sisters do? Amen. The second invitation I'm going to be giving for today is for those who would say, God, would you do something in my life like you did in their lives? God, would you increase that hunger in me? Lord, I want more of your purity in my life. Lord, I want more of your tangible presence in my life. Lord, I want more of your passion in my life. And I want more of your power in my life. Now, I was born into the home of an Assemblies of God pastor. My wife was born into the home of a committed lay couple in the church. I was born in Illinois, she here in Indiana. Ours is really the story of the impact of parents who made a commitment to live for Jesus. They made a commitment to live for Jesus through the good times and through the bad times. They made a commitment to live for Jesus when things were going great in the church and when things were not going so well in the church. They just made a commitment that they would live for Jesus Christ. Mom, Dad, you would do your children good if you make a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ that is not based upon the circumstances of the moment, but it's based upon the reality of who Jesus Christ is. Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9 puts it this way. If you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive so that they shall come again into this land. Within the text, it's a word from the Lord to the people of God who've gone off into captivity. And God is saying to them, if you will live for me, I'm going to restore your children back to the land from which they came. But there is somewhere in that a promise from God, a sense that when I make the commitment to live my life for Jesus Christ, it has an impact on the generation that is going to follow me. That I've been impacted by the generation that went before me. The life of my mother and the life of my father, the life of my mother-in-law, my father-in-law made an impact upon our lives. And mom and dad, I want to encourage you to live your lives in that way in front of your children. And guys and gals, I want to say to you that I want to encourage you to make a decision for Jesus at an early age in your life. My wife and I were both about eight years of age when we asked Jesus to come into our lives. Uh, I, that's the one I count anyway. I don't know how many times I got saved growing up. As I said, my father was an Assemblies of God pastor, and I got saved in every revival. Every evangelist that came through our city, I answered the salvation altar call. I am a statistic, and I have no idea how many people have me down as a statistic somewhere. But somewhere in there, I began to realize about the age of eight what it really was that Jesus Christ had done on the cross for me and gave my life to him. Early in life, Linda felt that God was calling her to be the wife of a preacher. And she made a decision that she would not give her heart to someone else. Her decision not to become involved with the young man who did not share her calling was a very, very important decision. Other friends that she grew up with did not make that same decision. And they did not understand the decision that she made. 
And there were moments of loneliness and moments that people thought there was something wrong with her because of that decision that she had made. But looking back on that decision, nearly 50 years down the road, she could tell you, comparing where she's at and where many of those other friends are at, that the decision she made was the right decision to make. Don't give your heart away to somebody who does not carry the same values that you carry. Amen. The age of 11, I felt God called me to preach. The age of 12, He filled me with the Holy Spirit. Now that calling did not come with an audible voice. It was that still, small voice of the Spirit of God in my heart. And when God called me to preach, my father said to the Lord, God, you made a mistake. You called the wrong son. Call his brother. His brother is more qualified. I hate to admit to it, but he was right. My brother was taller than I am. And smarter than I am. I'll never admit that to him, but... <laughs> maybe better looking than I am. I don't know. I have a better looking wife, but... Uh, than he's got, but uh, my apologies to my sister-in-law. I was not a good-looking candidate. I, I was so skinny when I turned sideways, I disappeared. I, I, would, I would lose my voice three, four times a year where I couldn't even whisper. And, and, and when I hadn't lost my voice, I spoke so fast, you could not understand me without the gift of interpretation of tongues. <laughs> Honest, I, I, I really did. I, I have a, somewhere in my possession for years, I had a cassette tape of an early sermon I preached. I can't understand it. <laughs> and I preached it. But I remember going out to that sense of the call of God in my life and standing in the empty auditorium of that building where my father's church met, and standing behind that pulpit, and there was this sense, this is where I belong. This is what God wants me to do. And the early attempts at preaching, though they definitely were not masterpieces, but there was something there, there was that confirming work of the Spirit of God. I actually began preaching at 17 years of age, though I was involved in working in the church uh, even before that. Linda was very active in her church uh, as a young lady. After graduating from Bible college, and I preached my way through Bible college because those uh, with the call to preach on their life must preach. I mean, there were days that if nobody else would listen to me, I would I'd lock myself in my room, turn the music up really, really loud so nobody could hear me, put a pillow up on my bed and preach to the pillow. I had to preach to somebody the good news of Jesus Christ. After graduating from Bible college, we spent 10 years pastoring churches. Uh, in the state of Illinois, two churches. I, I thought I was going to spend my life uh, in that last pastorate. And God was blessing. In the years that we pastored, the churches were growing in every dimension. And we should have been very satisfied with that. Our family was, uh, was blessed with, with two kids. Uh, and, and things were going well. But God began to stir the heart. And I would come home from a great Sunday. People having gotten saved. In the last four years I pastored, 250 people responded to the salvation altar call at the, pa and the altars of that church and gave their lives to Jesus. Uh, 39 people got baptized in the Holy Spirit uh, in the last year alone on Sundays in that church. Uh, we didn't even count those who got healed uh, because it wasn't a big deal when they got healed. It was a big deal when they didn't get healed. Uh, it was just the normal church life every week. Somebody got saved. Somebody got filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody got healed. It was just the blessings of God was giving to us. And we were enjoying that. But I'd come to this point now that with all of that was taking place, this inner restlessness. God, there, there has to be something else that you want us to do. So in 1984, we left the security of the pastor to follow the leading of the Lord into itinerant ministry. And I would say that from that day to this day, there is this deep, deep, deep sense of contentment, of fulfillment, that I'm doing that thing that God has asked me 
to do. When you are where God wants you to be, there will be that deep sense on the inside, this is where God wants me. It's not related to difficulty. You can be facing adverse circumstances and still on that inside have this assurance. Uh, this is where God wants me. You do not let the circumstances around you determine whether or not you are in the will of God. Uh, but you listen for that gentle voice of the Spirit of God and you, you pay attention to that sense on the inside uh, that says this is what I was created for. This is the purposes of God in my life. For 12 years, we crisscrossed the heartland of the USA in church revivals and camps. And by most standards of measurement, we were a success. We did not preach in the largest pulpits in our denomination, but we did preach with a full schedule. I was booked one and a half to two years in advance at all times. We saw what many people felt were great results. In 1995, I remember that we saw 800 people respond to a salvation altar call during the course of that year. In one preteen camp, in that same year, something like 115 students were baptized in the Holy Spirit in one service. And so we were seeing good fruit. In 1995, we'd respond to our first invitation to go overseas and had gone to, to Europe for ministry where the missionary said to us, by European standards, you have seen a landslide. We should have been very content. Schedule was full. Reputation was intact. I got a note from a district officer. He said, you are sane, solid, sensible, and spiritual. And then a friend of mine added this note, and safe. And so I was known as the safe evangelist. May not help you, but he won't hurt you. <laughs> you won't have a mess to clean up when he leaves. The future was bright, but we were slowly losing the spirit of the fight. My wife was becoming tired of fruitless meetings. As much as I would not admit it, I was becoming spiritually stale. And we loved Jesus. We were faithful in His work. Our devotional lives were intact. There was no sin that we were aware of that was in our lives. But we were saying this, there must be more than this. When I compared what I saw in my ministry with what I saw in the Word of God, something was missing. When I compare what I saw in my ministry with what I saw in the stories of church history, something was missing. Our hearts were beginning to cry out, there must be more. There must be something else. Linda was beginning to suggest to me that I should let her book the meetings that we were going to preach because she wanted to talk with the pastors before we got there so she could weed out those who are not really going after God so she could eliminate those who were just wanting to do their annual church revival. If they were not serious, she was not interested in being there. To be honest, I was afraid to give her the telephone. <laughs> I was concerned that when she got done, I would not have any meetings left <laughs> at all. She was tired of playing games. She was tired of standing at a resource table where there's this banner behind us that would say, you know, Sunday morning to Wednesday night, you're live in goods. And stand at the table and somebody saying to her on a Sunday morning, you're going to be here tonight? You know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You're going to be here tonight? Uh, yeah, I, and Monday and Tuesday and well, oh, you're going to be here Wednesday. You know, Monday and Tuesday. Psh, you know, just. And she was beginning to say, why are we living in this tin can? Why are we dragging our kids all over the United States if nobody really cares? There's got to be more. We were on a constant search to do what we were doing more effectively. And God began to surprise us. 
Often when God begins to respond to what's in your heart, He does it in a way that is not how you would have expected it. There are many significant moments in our lives that we do not realize have history written on them until later. Today could be significant for many. It could be that this is a God moment for you. If for nobody else, this could be a moment that God has said, I have set this moment aside. I put your name on this moment. I'm going to encourage you not to let this moment pass you by. On that first trip to Europe in 1995, and God took us to Europe so that He could lay me on the code floor of a hotel basement in Copenhagen, Denmark, and have somebody stand over top me and wave their hands and say, More, Lord, more. I remember laying on the floor thinking, More what? And, and, I, and I remember, because I, I didn't like it one bit. I'm laying on the floor. I don't feel God. I just feel cold. Uh, laying on the floor was not my option. I hadn't chosen to do that. They had prayed for me, and I ended up on the floor, which was not normal. You know, I'm one of these guys that there's 20 people in a prayer line, and 19 people fall on the floor, one person standing. You know, that... In fact, it's gotten to be a standing joke in some of the, in some of the conferences I'm involved with and some of the long-term uh, revivals I preach that when all the other preachers in the room are wasted, Michael will get the microphone <laughs> because he will still not be wasted. And there have been moments I have said, Lord, you know, I've got a really good idea. But you already, already told you he tends to think of my ideas. I said, well, how about you let me be wasted? And somebody else get the microphone. He basically says, I don't think so. Huh. So for those of you that feel like it never happens to me, been there, done that. For that particular service, I'm laying on the floor and I don't feel a thing except I can't get up. I'm Velcroed to the floor and I don't particularly like it. My eyes are closed, but I knew this guy was doing this because it was creating a shadow effect. Can say, more, Lord, more. Now, to be honest, if that gentleman were to walk in the room today, I would not recognize him. I don't remember what he preached. The only thing I remember is he was from, uh, from Asian extraction, and that's the total, totality of what I remember. Except he laid hands on me, and I found myself on the floor freezing. And him saying, more. I'm saying, Lord, more what? Well, I'll tell you what I got. I got more frustrated. I got more desperate. I got more hungry. I'm more willing to take a risk spiritually. Because sometimes God has to take us to that point. That he allows us to come to that place of desperation. And so sometimes he, he starts by pulling out the stuff that you're comfortable with. To bring you to a place to begin to say, God, let's do it your way. So we came back from Europe, spent about three weeks getting more desperate. And we were preaching in the southern part of the U.S. and had a meeting cancel. And uh, if you make your living preaching and your eating is connected to your preaching, and I happen to like eating, <laughs> cancellations are not the will of God. <laughs> I had this cancellation. I was preaching in a place that with my one and a half to two years in advance didn't help me because nobody in that area knew me. And uh, it was too far to come back up north and I didn't have enough money to do that anyway. And the pastor we were preaching was said, hey, you know, there's this revival going on in Pensacola, Florida. And uh, they've been in that thing like about eight months. Why don't you go down there and check it out and tell me what you think? Is it, is it really a move of God? Or is it one of those other things? We preachers are so egotistical. We think God needs us to check him out. But because I was going to be preaching only an hour away the next week, I said, yeah, may as well do that. So we went down there without a clue what God was doing, except some church was in eight months of revival service. And I'm asking myself, how did they do that? You know, I can't get people to come for four days. 
And they're going eight months. You know, what in the world is going on? Is the evangelist taking the church away from the pastor? I mean, what's the deal here? And I remember, I, I kind of sensed something maybe was up when I asked at the campground about 30 minutes from the church. I said, can you tell me where, you know, the Brownsville and Assembly God Church, I said, that's one in Revival, right? I said, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, we can tell where that one's at. Now, well, that's interesting because usually they couldn't tell me where anything I was preaching was at was located. I've, I've stopped at service stations and said, can you tell me where this church is? And they said, never heard of it, only to find out that the church is directly behind the service station. <laughs> no, it gets worse. They shared the rubbish bin together. <laughs> so the fact that they actually knew this, well, that got my attention. And so on the way in, I, I said to my wife, just, just said this to her, I said, you know, if this is God, there's three things I need. I need a fresh anointing. I need fresh direction. And I need fresh inspiration. And she thought, aren't you philosophical today? Now, I said those things because I was aware of the staleness. I was aware that I did need something. People would say, we, we love it when you come because there's such an anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I would think, what anointing? I don't sense it. And I knew that my wife was at the point that if things did not change, she was looking at burnout. And that, that I could not continue doing what we were doing with the same fruit. If I did that, I was going to put her into burnout that something had to change. My youngest son, who's still traveling with us, was saying, you know, he, he was talking about going and getting a church somewhere so he could win a high school to Jesus. Probably would have done that. So I said, God, I just need fresh direction. And Lord, I could just use some inspiration. So we pulled up outside the church and, and the marquee, the sign on the outside said, 17,000 saved in the last eight months. And uh, we all said the same thing at the same time. 17,000? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me right then. Not audible, just in my heart. I heard the Spirit of God say, uh, how many got saved in your last meeting? It wasn't 17,000. He was already preparing me for what was going to happen. So he walked into the building that Sunday morning and, uh, and there was an atmosphere. And I said, I grew up in this thing. And I had been the host pastor of citywide events. And, and so my first thought was, okay, it's like one of those citywide events. There's a buzz. And I thought, no, it's deeper than that. You see, there's always a buzz when you get a big event going to take place. And there's emotional excitement about that. I said, but no, this is, this is deeper. In fact, there was a presence. I said, I, I recognize that presence. I grew up in that presence. My father used to put it this way. He would describe his own story. I got saved in the fire. And I'm not satisfied with the smoke. There are a lot of churches that are living with just the smoke rising from the ashes of where there used to be a fire. And there are a lot of people that they're living their own lives. The fire, for whatever reason, is not burning in the same way that it was. And life has become more about the smoke than about the fire. I recognize that presence. It took me back to my, my growing up years. We sat in the service that particular morning and... Uh, it, um, it was a great service. It, it, was, it was interesting because it, they had testimonies and some ladies testifying about how last night she watched the dove fly off of the stained glass windows. And he flew around the auditorium and fire was coming off of his wings. And I'm saying to myself, lady, you are weird. <laughs> There's a lot of things God had to work on me on. But I was listening to also the stories of backstood and airline pilots who gotten saved. Preachers who had encounters with Jesus. And I'm listening to these stories and it's getting my attention. And I couldn't deny the presence. And I'm watching people doing the worship. And, and I'll never forget this guy. His, his next section over, we're like on the front row of a section, you know, somewhere about two-thirds of the way back in that auditorium, but the front row. And this guy 
over next we hit, during the worship, he suddenly just falls on the ground. Okay. And then this lady comes out and she kneels down in front of us, hands lifted, just worshiping, and bang, out she goes. And so I'm kind of watching them and thinking, I hope it's not contagious. <laughs> just kind of. You know, I don't know if that was God or that was flesh because I've seen both. But I got watching a little girl. Found out later my son and my wife were watching her as well. For probably 20, maybe 25, 30 minutes in a space no larger than three or four foot in any direction, eyes closed, dancing before the Lord. Now, I was watching a whole bunch of people dancing. I don't know if it was God or the Jerusalem two-step, but with her. There was something. She was caught up with him. And I'm, wa- and I'm watching people shake. Now, my grandmother, when she, after she got saved, and she would feel the Lord touch her, she would do this. Woo! <laughs> and, and I had, you know, kind of cynically over the years, learned to describe that as learned cultural behavior. I mean, we do have culture in church. You know, I prayed for people in, in a line, and they're checking out the rest of the line. Yep, they're all falling. <laughs> but, but I'm watching some people doing stuff that morning. I'm thinking, I don't know who'd want to do that. <laughs> but I couldn't deny his presence here. And then the guest speaker got up and wasn't the evangelist for the meeting. I, he didn't preach on Sunday mornings. I didn't know that. And, the pastor wasn't even there. He's he off at a conference somewhere. And so this guy from our national headquarters was speaking. And he kept saying, we think this is our Azusa Street. Now, I'm a bit of a church historian, so I knew what Azusa Street was about. I understood not only what God did there. I understood how that impact carried around the world. And so he had my attention. And, uh, and then he finished preaching, and he said, I want to pray for all of those in this auditorium that you have a bad back. My back was killing me. So like a good Assemblies of God preacher, I stayed in my seat. (laughs) It's not a proud moment, it's just the truth. And then he said, I want to pray for all of those who have bad knees. My left knee hurt so bad When I'd roll over at night, it would wake me up. My son was thinking the only thing left is for him to say what Michael Livengood. (laughs) (laughs) From Illinois. So I wandered down to the front of the building. Now, I'm not like I'm down there by myself. There's 300 people or so in this line. and We're all in suits because that's what they wore back then. So I'm, I'm standing there and The evangelist gets to me first, and I don't even know who he is. I found that out later. But he gets to me first, he looks at me, he says, why are you here? I'm thinking, that's a dumb question. I said, well, I said, well, you know, bad back, bad knee. He said, no, you're not. I almost argued with him. He just kept staring at me. Finally he said, you're here for a fresh anointing. The antenna went up. I said, yeah, that's the real reason. That's what I had said to my wife that morning. They prayed for me. My back didn't get any better. My knee didn't change. But something happened in here. And I recognized I was not there by accident. God, the creator of the universe, had so orchestrated the events of my life to position me in that place at that moment. We didn't even know what the schedule was, did not know they did not do a Sunday night service because Sunday morning might go to somewhere in the middle of Sunday afternoon, which it did that day. And Monday night was their rest night, and Tuesday was prayer. And, and so I was going to come and pray. By the way, I stepped in the auditorium this morning during prayer time. That was awesome. If I didn't know that was going on, I'd been here faster. <laughs> But uh, I was going to go to the prayer meeting, but I went golfing that day and got hung up on the golf course and couldn't get off in time. To So he came back for the Wednesday night service. And uh, 
preacher preached, and I was pretty critical of the message. I remember thinking, no, they're going to get saved on that thing. Yeah. And I think he preached one of those nights on the three lights of divine guidance. You know, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and circumstances when all three are in agreement. That's a green light. You know, go. And I'm thinking, that's not much of a salvation sermon. It is when that guy preached it. He talked about the Word of God reveals it's God's will that you get saved. And the Spirit of God has convicted you of your sins and He's brought you circumstantially to this place at this time. Get out of your seat and get to the altar and get saved. And they started running past me. And I'm counting. At 75, I lost count. And again, I heard the Holy Spirit say, Now, uh, how many got saved in your last meeting? It's like what he really was saying was this, Shut up and pay attention. Because if you'll let me, I'm about to do something in your life. But if you stay critical, it's not going to happen. And then they said, now we want to pray for everybody that this is your first night in the revival. And uh, being a legalist at heart, I thought, well, I was here on Sunday, so this isn't my first service. And then they gave that invitation of something like 1,500, 2,000 people went to the front. That's what the auditorium seated. And I said, some of you are lying through your teeth. <laughs> you cannot all be first-timers. It's not possible. <laughs> so I finally wandered down to the, to the altar area, and I'm watching. Now, I grew up in this thing, okay? I, I ran youth camps for years. Been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. I mean, you know, I've seen it all. But I saw something I had never seen in my life. I was watching teenagers chasing preachers in order to receive prayer. Now, I ran youth camps. I was used to chasing teenagers. <laughs> you know? That's what preachers who run youth camps do. You know, you chase preachers. And so I was used, I mean, you, chase, you chase the teenagers, but I'm watching these teens chasing the preachers. And I said to myself, I don't do that. I am not a groupie. <laughs> this, is, this is becoming embarrassing, you know? I said, I, I am not chasing men, I'm chasing Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's like the Holy Spirit said, well, you're not hungry enough yet, are you? So you can wait. And I stood there for two hours. One of my pet peeves is standing in long lines. I stood there with people with badges. I said, prayer team, they walk up to me like this. And for two hours, it's like I was invisible. Because I said, Lord, I'll stand right here and they can come pray for me. <laughs> and for two hours, they just kept passing me. Walk up, walk off. And finally, after about two hours, the evangelist walked up and he, he said to me, I see you. I'm, thinking, I'm glad somebody does. And he said this. It's a word from the Lord. There's a fresh anointing coming on you. It's like you're, you're lying in a river. You're laughing. You're floating. A lot of work is getting done. But now you're not doing it. Now the current is. And there are some on the banks. And they're jealous. But you're saying, come on in. There's plenty. Oh. By the way, you are in the center of God's will. And God is going to use you to start this fire in many places. And then they picked me up off the floor. Exactly the three things I had said to my wife. But I knew this man did not know. Unknown to me, my wife and my son had walked up behind me just as he said, and you were in the center 
of God's will. And God is going to use you. We go back to our trailer about, I don't know, 2 o'clock that morning. Got up the next morning for breakfast. Our son was still asleep. We poured ourselves a bowl of cornflakes and sat down to eat. Linda said, oh, I bought a tape last night. She was always buying a, a tape. And so she bought, said, I bought a tape last night looking for new music. So she went to the tape deck and she put it in and punched the play button. For those of you that may be familiar with that revival, it was out of Brownsville number two, who Creation Calls. They had not done one measure of that song until the presence of God tangible filled that RV. <sighs> Linda was standing with her back to me. And she was almost afraid to turn around because she was feeling the presence and thinking, Lord, if Michael doesn't feel this, I don't know what I'm going to do. She said she almost just walked into the bedroom and closed the door so she could fall across the bed and just weep in his presence. But when she turned around, I was sitting at the breakfast table with my hands in the air and the tears streaming down my face. And we sat there for the next 45 minutes as the cornflakes got soggy. <laughs> and nobody cared. The presence of God. And we spent the rest of that day walking on the campgrounds and weeping. And went to church that night and got prayed for and walked and wept. I learned after a few days how to out-elbow the teenagers. <laughs> I learned how to figure out where the preachers were heading and which pew to climb over to get there first. I learned how to do all of that. And what I thought would be just a couple of nights of enjoying a good service, God said, I got an appointment. Still didn't understand what God was doing. In fact, after that, we were, we were scheduled to, to speak a Sunday to church in the area, so we went and did that. And, and one of those moments with, with God that Sunday morning, right before the service, God changed my sermon, gave me a, a new title on a prepared heart. And I had written down a few chicken scratches. And during the worship that came this moment, there was an utterance in tongues interpretation. And, and the interpretation was this, the revival you have prayed for starts now. Prepare your heart. And people started running to the altar. The pastor and I ended up on our faces on the platform. I'm not thinking, what am I going to Finally slid my notes in front of him. He looked at that title and said, I think maybe you better preach. We shared for a few moments. I thought it was the God saying that, which the church had longed for, but in hindsight, it wasn't that at all. It was God saying to us, that which you have been asking me for, it begins now. That next week, if you had a badge on, I'd get in front of you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Left there and went to a church that was trying to throw the pastor out. Now, listen, I've done enough evangelism, revival meetings to understand that when a church gets that badly divided, you're not going to have a move of God. It doesn't happen. Greatest move of God that had in 25 years. Probably the most significant thing, though, was for me was the morning I was in the auditorium praying and saying, well, what do, what do you want me to ask you for? What's on your heart? Every year I would set a target of people I was praying for to get saved. And, and I heard the Spirit say to me, 1,500. And I said, Lord, uh, I'm not in that size of church to see that. And Lord, we're not doing a lot of camps this summer, and we're not doing the sort of stuff that's going to lead to those type of numbers. And he said, and next year, it will be 2,500. And then he said the line that changed really everything again for me. He said, the day of fruitless meetings is over. And I didn't understand that because I'd preached my share of fruitless meetings. 
And I said, Lord, am I, am I going to die? <laughs> I was in my early 40s, so I can, you know, am I going to die? Uh, that doesn't sound good. Uh, Jesus is going to come. That sounds good, you know. You yeah. Do that. And for 30 minutes, I wept. Went out to the RV and tried to explain to my wife what had just happened to me and wept for 30 more minutes and then watched. I'm going to begin to bring this thing in for a landing here in just a moment. For the next six months, we never said a word to anybody. We didn't tell them that they were not going to beat the Baptist to Bonanza today. I would just preach. Talk about being hungry for God. I give an invitation for people to get right with God, get the sin out of their lives. Sometimes people got saved, sometimes they did not. And then I would give an invitation for those who were desperate, who were hungry. Those who are saying, when I take a look at my life, it doesn't measure up to what I read in the Scripture. I want more. And it wasn't about performance. We would just say, I would just say, if you're hungry, I want to pray with you. And people would come, and I didn't tell them what was getting ready to take place. In fact, I didn't even have any catchers because I don't want anybody to think I was suggesting anything. But about the third person I would pray for, I was so sorry for the first two. <laughs> huh. But about the third person I'd pray for, the Spirit of God would just, poof, and suddenly it was all on. And some guy would go, do you want me to catch people? <laughs> but it wasn't that they were falling. I've seen that for years. I've seen that which was God. I've seen that which was not. It's what was happening while they were on the floor. It was the stories that they were sharing when they got to their feet. The bitterness that had been ripped out of their hearts. The broken relationships that God began to restore. The stuff that was beginning to take place in their lives. It was, it was absolutely life transforming for them. For six months we watched that. Just like, wow, God, really? And then we walked into a church in northeastern, I'm sorry, northwestern Indiana. And uh, I was the substitute preacher. Uh, they were doing this little weekend of reconciliation. Two churches, one was a split from the other. And so they were doing this weekend of reconciliation. God had put in the hearts of one of the deacons that we need to have this weekend. And, and, and they agreed to do this. And they had a guest speaker scheduled. And just before he was to get there, there was a death in his family and he couldn't come. And so my name was given to them by a denominational leader who was actually out of one of those two churches. And he called me and he said, the pastor's going to call you. We need you to come to Michigan City. And I said, I don't want to. He said, you owe me one. I introduced Linda to you. <laughs> He still pulls that one on me. <laughs> and um, so we went. And uh, he preached the Friday night service. I was to preach the Saturday night. And on that Saturday night, I just preached about being hungry for God, getting the sin out of our lives. Gave an invitation, 15, 20 people, something like that. Responded to the salvation invitation and and after we pray with them, the only thing I had in my heart was this. I was to pray for the two pastors and their spouses. So I asked them to come and just stand at the front. I remember walking over and laying my fingertip on the forehead of the host pastor and his wife. And when my fingertip touched their foreheads, they hit the floor. He told me later, he said, I didn't believe in that. He said, I have seen, he said, I've been pushed by people. Because I knew God could, but I never seen anything that I thought God did. He said, but when your fingertip touched me, he said, I couldn't stay to my feet if my life had depended on it. He hit the ground and lay there for two and a half hours, unable to move. The other pastor's wife, she hit the floor. I hadn't touched her. Prayed for her husband. He joined them. There's this audible gasp in the auditorium because they knew this bunch doesn't do that. I didn't know that. I didn't know anybody. Walked back to the platform and grabbed the microphone. I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, now I want you to pray for the 
the deacons and elders and spouses and the staff and spouses. So I said that. And uh, 24 people came to stand at the front. And so I'm standing on the platform kind of wandering around while they're getting in a, some semblance of a line. My plan was to walk off and to begin to lay hands on them. I began to pray something that I think was basically irrelevant. And as I came to the close of that, before I could move to pray for anybody, I can only describe it as a power surge went past me, just psh, northwest corner of that platform, past me, and the person standing on that end of the line, 20 feet away from me, hit the ground. 24 people in a row like dominoes. I'm, ho I'm holding the microphone going. <laughs> there was an audible gasp in the auditorium because they knew that bunch doesn't do that and the dude hasn't touched anybody yet. The only thing I knew was this. We had just experienced a suddenly that the God of the universe had chosen to stop at that place. I looked at my wife, whose eyes were as wide as saucers, and I said to her, I mouthed the word to her, did you feel that? She's going. <laughs> she said later, she, when that power surge went past her, her legs had buckled. She grabbed the keyboard so she could stand her feet to play. I turned back to the church and I said this, uh, if, uh, if uh, you want more of God, I, uh, I think I get to the altar. <laughs> that was my invitation. I was still, I was still too stunned to. 250 people ran at the altar. What followed was total Holy Ghost chaos. Anything I'd ever read, I saw. People draped over seats, stacked up on top of each other on the floor. I didn't have a prayer team. Had I had a prayer team, I'd been the bunch on the floor. The only thing I knew was God just turned up. And it was all on. And the next morning, another 15 people got saved. That Sunday night, another 15 people got saved. And the pastor said, can you stay a few days? The other church across town, they said in the middle of their Sunday morning service, the whole worship team hit the floor. The Spirit of God invaded their building. For the next 15 weeks, those two churches came together in nightly services. 495 names on cards responded to a salvation invitation. Some were over 100 people baptized in the Holy Spirit. Don't really know the exact number on that and the stories. Water baptismal services, they got positively dangerous. People getting slain in the spirit of the baptismal tank. It was wild. Absolutely ballistic. The parking lot sometimes looked like a war zone. People trying to get to their cars and couldn't. Bodies on the... People started feeling the presence of God a block, two blocks away, coming down the street. One of my favorite stories was the lady who was on her way to an all-cult healer. That's where she was going. And her car gets to the parking lot as she feels a pair of hands take hold of the steering wheel and turn her car into the parking lot. She had no idea where she was at. Did not know what the building was, but she was afraid not to come in. Mm -hmm. So she and her oxygen bottle came in the building. When I gave the salvation invitation, she came. She gave her life to Jesus. And then we prayed for people, and she stayed at the front, and I prayed for her, and she and the oxygen bottle hit the ground. And the altar worker said, no, 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 you got to hear this story. And she told me what I just told you that this lady had told her. It was that type of story, night after night after night. The pastor of the church said to me, he said, are you aware that the average church gets one of these stories a generation and we're getting one a week? The incredible, the lady testifying from the baptismal tank that she was a prostitute. We're all going, she said, what? I, I don't even know who invited her, but somebody had. And she met the one who loved her. And there's going to be, and he'd already paid the price for her salvation. I could go on and on with the stories, but it wasn't just there. 
for the next four years, place after place after place. And God finally said, would you go to New Zealand? I walked into the nation of New Zealand into a 20-week revival, 800 people getting saved. I cannot say to people, I'll be as honest as I can with this, I can't say that every place is at the same level, but this is what I've discovered, that God is faithful to the promises of His Word. And where there are hungry people, God will meet with them. Let me wind this thing down. Here's what I learned. Here's the things that changed. The passion for prayer, that changed. The hunger for holiness, that changed. Not what can I get away with, but how close can I come to Him? The return of the joy. I'd wake up every morning with a song. What happened in the ministry? Fun came back. Stuff started happening. God's stuff. But how do we keep... A friend of mine introducing me, said, of all the people that I know personally who went to that revival... He said, I would argue that probably Michael and Linda have seen that anointing stay with them longer than anybody else I know personally. I thought, Lord, why? Because you already told me I'm average. There's nothing unique about us. I finally came to these conclusions. Number one, we never lost the hunger. Never lost the hunger. It's hungry today. We'd do crazy things. We'd drive from Michigan to Pensacola for a weekend if we had three days off. I'd drive 17 hours so I could sit on the floor. Never lost the hunger. We learned to stay where the anointing is. For what you feed grows and what you starve dies. If you feed your spiritual appetite, it will grow. If you starve it, it's going to die. We kept going after God. Kept getting prayed for. Kept going after God. Started working even more on obedience. I thought I was obedient. But little things like this. He, uh, he said to me one day, uh, you tell me there's some things you want to see. I'm telling you that if you're going to see that, you're going to have to increase your prayer time. Not that I was buying God off, but God knew that I needed more time spent with Him because there were changes that needed to take place inside of me to handle what He wanted to do. He reminded me that as a teenager, He'd asked me to tithe my day in prayer. I had not done it. But He said, I'm asking you to do that again. For a season, He asked us if we would fast when we were in meetings every other day. It became a matter bigger than the fasting. It became a matter of the obedience. Will you do what I ask you to do? The invitation to go overseas was never a part of my plans for the future. When God called me to preach, my negotiation was this. Yes, Lord, but just don't send me to Chicago. <laughs> Growing up in downstate Illinois, I don't want to go to Chicago. I never thought about saying, but overseas, it never crossed my mind. I preached all over the city of Chicago and other places. And I learned that in that process of being obedient, what I received was a lot more than I may have thought I was giving up. And number five, stay consistent in what we needed to maintain. You see, I've learned that as much as I love being in the house of God, as much as I love revival services, the most important time I spend every day is not standing at a pulpit. The most important time I spend every day is alone, or my wife and I alone with Jesus. Literally, we have made our car a mobile chapel. My wife felt that she wanted to listen to the Word of God being read the entirety of the Bible in a 31-day period of time. 
And so she's been listening. And we just took a couple of weeks to go see family in Arizona. And so we drove from here to Arizona listening and praying in the Holy Ghost the whole way. Almost every day, get up in the morning, get in the car, start praying in tongues. I've been doing that, and I prayed for tongues for years. But the last few months, I find I can hardly sit down in my car that I don't want to start just praying in the Holy Spirit. I don't understand everything that has taken place around us. I don't understand everything that's taking place inside of me. But this awareness, there are yet promises that He has made to me but I have not yet seen fulfilled. And there are promises He has made to you that you have not yet seen fulfilled. And I don't know what the future holds, but this I know, He who promised is faithful. But there will always be attached to that a requirement on my part. Now in a few moments, we're going to be praying for people. In a few moments, we will be praying. Pastor will be praying with those who are watching online. So I want you to stay online. I want you to get prayed for. In a few moments, we will be praying for people here in this auditorium. And I, and I, and I want to say this before I, I step out of the way, and, and then more, an offering is going to be received. And I've said to the Lord many times this, God, I'm not interested in gimmicks. I've seen people that there's, there's just a certain way they do stuff. I, I realized as a pastor that my people had me pegged when they told me, you know, when you take the pulpit, the first thing you always say is praise the Lord. And I caught myself doing another one a moment ago. One of my people said, do you know you always close your notes five minutes before you're done preaching? <laughs> I said, Father, I'm not interested in just doing a routine. But Father, I want to catch what's on your heart. And there are moments he gives like really, really specific directions. And there are moments he basically says, I'll let you know when the moment's right. That happens more than the other. In a few moments, we want to pray with people. And I think what's going to happen so we're just going to come and say, Lord, would you, would you fan the hunger? Would you fan the hunger in me? Because you see, what I'm after is something that's bigger than one service. And it's bigger than a series of meetings. I'm after something that long after nobody remembers who we are. Something has continued to take place in the life of an individual. And after more of those stories of the preacher who said 20 years ago, this was my prayer. That's what I'm after. Those who say, God changed my life in those days. And God wants to change our lives. We've come out of a year like we have never, ever experienced. And I do not know what's going to take place a month from now. I don't know which side of the prophets is going to be right and which side of the prophets is going to be wrong. But I know this, faithful. And I'm asking God to stir up her hunger. And I've been asking God to meet with somebody today in a way that will change who you are for the rest of your life. So in a few moments, we're going to pray with people. Whether you're online or you're here in the auditorium, I want to encourage you. In a few moments, I'm going to give an invitation for those that there is sin and you need to deal with it. And I want to say that with every ounce of compassion that I can. But I also do not want to back off one bit from confronting people and saying, if there's sin in your life, you've got to deal with it. You don't get to heaven if you don't. You're not going to experience the fullness of what He has for you. If you don't. So there will be an invitation. And then we're going to come and say, Lord, would you meet with me? Would you fill me with more of you? And whatever comes along with that package, I'll take. Amen. Pastor.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So um, normally at this point, I would turn to the word, and the, and this morning I was going to speak from Mark chapter 4, but I'm not going to do that this morning. I'm just going to paraphrase some things. Jesus said that everything in the kingdom of God is as if a man would sow a seed. So right now, it's an opportunity to sow seed. Hallelujah. Both Jesus and Paul talked about seed sowing and harvest time. If you read in Mark chapter 4 later about the parable, read the portion where he gave his interpretation of the parable because you'll discover there that it's really not about the size of the gift. It's about what he's spoken to your heart and it's about what is in your heart that counts because seed was sown on different kinds of ground had to do with the heart of the person, the heart of the sower. Whether Satan comes to steal it, whether you allow tribulations or persecutions to take the word out of your heart, whether you allow the deceitfulness of riches, the lust and desire for other things, and other things come into your life to crowd out the things, to crowd out the word of God, that's your determination, that's your heart. But you also have an opportunity to sow into good ground. The word of God in a good heart that receives the word, also gives back and sows. Sowing and giving is part of our worship. We have an opportunity today to sow into revival, to sow into ministry. So I'm going to say this today. Um, if you came only prepared to give one gift uh, designated towards our evangelists today, we're not worried about God taking care of our needs here. I know we've got three projects going on. We've got other things going on. But today, God sent us a gift. You know, the Bible says there's five gifts that Jesus gave to the church. The gift of the evangelist is one of them. And we have a chance today to sow into that gift. And when you sow into that gift, God has promised you to give a harvest. I'm not saying don't bring your tithes, don't bring your offerings, don't do your other things. But I am saying this, listen to God and do what he says. So let's stand and let's just pray. In front of you, there's an envelope. Those of you who are giving online, you can go to mfhfw.org or .com, either one, and you can sow a seed. On PayPal, it'll give you an opportunity to, des to designate your seed if you wish to do that. So uh, on, your, on your envelopes today, if you're giving towards uh, the evangelist, just make sure you mark it on it, make it clear so that we can give him everything that you've designated for him. So let's pray. Father, we just ask you today you. that you will direct our giving, that you would direct our sowing. And we're so thankful and grateful for your promise. You promised, Father, a harvest. And Father, you know what our needs are well in advance of what we do. You said, Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. So today, we set aside our cares we set aside our concerns for this next year, for our jobs, for our careers, for our livelihood, for our provision. We set those aside, Lord, and focus on you, focus on your word, and focus on your work. So today, Lord, I ask you that you would show each of us what we're to sow, what we're to give. And Father, I'm thankful and grateful for your Holy Spirit speaking the right words, the right amounts, the right designations. And Father, thank you that you are honoring your word in our lives. It will not return empty. It will accomplish what you please. It will prosper where you send it. So Lord, thank you for keeping your word, for hastening to keep your word, for performing your word in our lives. And for it, we're grateful and thankful today in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, you can, you can be seated again and then... Uh, She's going to collect the offering. Sarah is here. Praise the Lord. As soon as she's finished, we're going to pray over it. And don't go away because we're going to pray over you online uh, on YouTube's live stream today. I keep wanting to say Facebook live stream, but we're not there anymore. We're on YouTube today. So God bless you. And uh, we want you to receive today. So prepare your hearts to receive. Sow your seed and prepare your heart to receive. Amen. Amen. 
Praise the Lord. So God's promise to you is that when you sow, it'll come back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's his promise to you. Jesus spoke those words. We didn't make those words up. So let's trust him. Let's believe him. And let's watch him move in our lives in a powerful, powerful way. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. As soon as everybody's had a chance to give, then we're going to pray over the offering. Believe God together. Amen. Are you disappointed that you came today? No. Amen. I'm glad because you're about to see something you've never seen before. Hallelujah. All right, let's pray. Father, you're the giver of every good and perfect gift. You're the Father of lights in heaven. So we pray your blessing over these tithes and offerings today, Father. We thank you, Father, for multiplying the seed sown, for increasing the fruit of our righteousness, and for making this the greatest day that we've ever lived. Thank you, Jesus, for seeing the hearts of these who have given Father, for honoring their faith and for bringing back a wonderful harvest in whatever way they need it. Father, some need today healing. Some need restoration in their families. Some are just broken and don't even know what they need. Some, Lord, uh, need love. Some need other kinds of blessings. So, Lord, today we release our faith over these offerings and over these people. <coughs> these who have sown these gifts, those online who have sown. And we ask you, Father God, and thank you in advance for honoring your word in their lives in a powerful way. And for it, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in Jesus' name. Please, Lord, accept this act of worship. We thank you, Father God, that your word is sure, your word is true, and it never returns empty. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. If somebody, um, I, would you help me with this? Just move this back here as far as we can move it. And I'm going to ask Michael to come back, and we're going to pray over those on uh, YouTube live stream. So get ready to receive in Jesus' awesome, majestic and wonderful name. Amen. So go ahead. For those of you that are watching on the YouTube, I want to, I want to share a quick story. Um, the person I mentioned does not know about this story, but a few years ago, uh, my wife and I were taking a few days of rest. Uh, a friend had provided a place for us to stay, and we were preparing to go out for lunch, but with the television on and Carol Arnott from uh, the Toronto Out Revival was, was speaking. And there came a moment that um, she wanted to pray for people. And her, her message was, light the fire again. Light the fire again. She had this cigarette type lighter, or propane type propane. of, propane lighter. This, she kept pointing at, at people and light the fire again. <laughs> and now we had our coats on. It was winter. We're getting ready to step out to go get in our car and go get lunch. And she pointed that thing at the camera. I said that because I want you to know that sometimes we limit the anointing mm -hmm. to the room we're in. We were literally on the other side of the globe. And when she pointed the thing at the camera to light the fire again, we both were hit by the Spirit of God watching that program. I found myself doubled over and uh, we were quite delayed getting to lunch that day and it was okay and so if you're watching online i want you to believe god with us that god will light the fire again and that the same types of things that god wants to do in the hearts of people here he wants to do in your heart and in your life for those who are watching online and you're away from the lord i want to pray a prayer and i want you to pray this with me we're going to ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, come into our lives. When you pray this prayer, it's very important that you tell somebody, whether it's somebody you're sitting with, 
or you send a note to this pastor. But if you need to come back to Jesus, I want to pray this prayer. I want you to pray this with me. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I have sinned. I have sinned. I have done things. I have done things. That hurt you. That have hurt you. That hurt others. That have hurt others. And that have hurt myself. I have hurt myself. And I want to say to you. And I want to say to you. I am sorry. I am sorry. I believe. I believe that you're the son of God. That you're the son of God. That you died on the cross. You died on the cross. To pay for my sins. To pay for my sins. And right now, right now, I receive. I receive your salvation. Your salvation. I ask you. I ask you. Come into my life. Come into my life. The best I know how. The best I know how. I open myself to you. I open myself to you. Right now. Right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And listen, you prayed that prayer, he hurt you. If you were honest, he would do exactly what he said he would do. He's preparing a place for you in heaven. Now it's important that you connect with a group of believers. Probably if you're watching this thing, you have some connection with this church. But if you don't, you just came across this. You didn't come across it by accident. God wanted you to know that he has a plan for you what he did in my life, he'll do that and more in your life. I want to encourage you to get a hold of this pastor, send a note. I pray that prayer. Now, Father, I pray for others who are watching right now. Holy Spirit, I understand better than anybody in this room or on this program that apart from you, I have nothing. I am average. But Father, if you will take, as you have many times, and you will breathe upon us and breathe through us, Father, I pray for that individual watching. I pray for that broken. I pray for that one that feels like the anointing is gone, is dissipated. I pray, Father, for that preacher who's going to be watching this thing. And, and Father, they feel like the anointing they once had is no longer there. Father, I'm asking even now that you'll speak to their heart. You're about to bring it back. And Father, I'm asking, Lord, if they were standing in front of me, I'd probably lay my fingertip on their forehead. And I would just say, Father, more. So that's what I'm saying, Father. Would you do more? Would you release more of yourself in that living room? hotel room, in that bedroom, in that car, would you release more of your presence right now? Holy Spirit, would you breathe on them and turn this moment into a sacred moment, life changing. Thank you, Lord, for your healing anointing flowing. Yeah. For those with back problems, knee problems, pain in their bodies, you go now in Jesus' name. Yes. And by the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for manifesting yourself strong on behalf of these who've come to seek you today. Yes. Let your presence, let your power fill their rooms, fill their homes, fill their lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for that person with a bad heart. Receive now in the name yes, of Jesus. Yes. Receive the healing anointing of Jesus flowing yes, over you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. May your heart beat strong and well. Take blood to every extremity of your body. And let every artery, blood vessel be unclogged. Yes. In Jesus' name and by yes. the power of the blood of Jesus. Yes. Those with a cancer diagnosis. In Jesus' name, we're speaking to that cancer. We command yes, you to we die are. by the blood of Jesus. Yes, we are. And by the power of Jesus' name, yes. be healed and set free. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing anointing yes. flowing over every life. Thank you, Father God, for your word being accomplished in their lives today in a powerful way. Yes. Those with other sicknesses, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your healing flow over them right now. Every matter of For covering every person, Lord, with your love today. The love you took to the cross when you bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. 
thank you Jesus for your healing flow and for your deliverance coming that person that's troubled with anxieties in the name of Jesus I rebuke those anxieties and fears and by the blood of Jesus be free now we thank you for it Father in Jesus name Amen and Amen We prepare to pray with people here in the room. Let me say something first of all about the table, because I didn't. Then we're going to comment and we'll pray. Um, there's several books back there. There's some books on the right hand side as you look at the table, read by a missionary friend of ours. Those are complimentary. We're just helping him get those books into the hands of individuals. There's a little booklet there that says something like this uh, Why I love Muslims and why I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a message my missionary friend preached in a Muslim mosque at their invitation to come and to preach. So he shared with them his love. He spent 25 years in Afghanistan ministering in the Muslim world. He understands him as well as anybody that I know. And so some excellent material there. Those are free. On the left-hand side of the table is some stuff that I've written. And... Uh, and, and there's also a book called Survivor, which is written by a friend of mine dealing with cancer. The three books I've written are all on the subject of revival. I'm not going to claim to be an expert. I don't think that critter exists. But we've been granted by God some experiences. And we've been trying to put that into writing so that those places we'll never get and the things we cannot say will be available to individuals. There's one book called What Happens During Revival. It's a little booklet. deals with the unusual. People falling out of the power of God, trances, shaking, all of the stuff. I deal with it biblically and historically. It's been very helpful for a lot of people who've struggled with it. There's a book called The Glory Factor. Um, it's the relationship between revival and the glory of God. One after it was written, after all of the people had done the review, I got a note from a pastor's wife in Germany. She said, I've just finished reading your book. It's the first book I've read that connected for me the glory movement and revival. My first thought was, how'd you get my book in Germany? And um, she said, I've got books on the glory. I've got books on revival. Yours brought it together in a way that made sense. I understand it. And uh, God's been pleased to use that thing. The newest one's called the wow factor. They call it the wow factor because when God shows up, usually your first response is, wow. And I deal with what is it that attracts the presence of God? How do you sustain an ongoing revival? How do you sustain a move of God in your life? And what do you do when the meetings are over? The opposition sets in. And uh, so I think you'll find it helpful. Those are two of the three books. There's a try out of the third, but I'm going to read it right uh, on uh, third factor and revival. But uh, I would encourage you to get those. Um, I've had some people say these things are textbooks on revival. And that if you're hungry for revival, um, Terry Roberts and uh, Brownsville called a mandatory reading. And uh, so he said, if you don't, if you're not hungry, he said, don't get it. But I uh, just want to say that to you. One of my hesitations always in telling stories is I feel like, God, I don't want to, I'm not totally over that deal that I said, God, uh, you know, that's not my anointing. Send him back to the Philippines and I'll stay here. I get feeling intimidated. I want us to focus this morning not on the person praying for you, but on him. And I will tell people this. I believe God heals the sick. I have prayed for people with every type of condition, and God has healed them. I believe God fills people with the Holy Spirit. At least a dozen times in my life, I've been in the service. I was the preacher where more than 100 people got baptized in the Holy Spirit. In none of those services was I, was I preaching exclusively in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. If I've had a theme, it's been about being hungry for God, inviting His presence. And these things happen when He comes. And so when I pray, I may be very simple. 
Now, sometimes God gives me a prophetic word for somebody, and I'm willing to go there if He does. I also don't crusade for that. If He doesn't, that's His business, not mine. But I've often said to people, can we just come and say, Lord, what I want is You. Nothing more than You, and nothing less than You. In the process of that, what happens is this, people get healed. Because when the healer comes, he heals people. Sometimes they don't even realize they got healed till later, but they're just lost in him. Then they get not just the healing, they get more than that. And people who come just looking for tongues, that they go disappointed, they come wanting more of him. And they get filled with the Holy Spirit, the tongues comes, but they get more than that. And so I'm gonna to say to you this morning, we'll begin to pray for people. I want you to come say, God, I just want more of you. Whatever level your experience has been, God, can you take it up another notch? And I'm not after a particular manifestation. I said it every night in a 19-week revival. I don't care whether you stand or you fall. What I want you to do is be open. Because if you're open, God's going to do something in your life. One deacon said, I finally came to believe you actually meant that. Because then when I quit worrying about whether I was going to stand or fall, because I had an encounter with Him. So if you fall, you fall. Somebody asked me once, why do people fall down when you pray for them? I said, because they can't stand up. I said, it's not complicated. You know, sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. I don't care. What I want is something that's six weeks from now six months from now that something has so happened in you that when you walk in the room His presence walks in with you in such a tangible way that the atmosphere begins to be changed because you're there. You see, the scripture talks about a day in Isaiah chapter 60 a day of gross darkness we're getting there that the light would shine on us. His glory would arise on us. The darker the night, the more the glory. We're going to be into a season of great darkness. But God wants you to walk with genuine glory in your life. What's going to happen when you pray for me? Don't know. Some of you aren't, are not going to feel a thing. But you're going to get home discover something happened to you. And some of you are going to need help getting out of the door. It happens. <laughs> I, 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 I love the, I love the, and I, I really like it, the nice one's the unexpected person, you know? Yeah. And, and, or, or the mayor of a city who said to me after service, I have never experienced it because I grew up in this. He goes, I was standing at my seat and the presence of God was so thick at my seat, I had to hold the chair just to stay on my feet. I hadn't touched him, but he had come. So I don't care whether I pray for you or not. Uh, you don't have to wait for me. I will lay hands on as many as I can, just say, Lord, more of you, more of you. And let's let him sort that out from there. Is that fair enough? Now, if you say, I'm not really comfortable having somebody lay hands on me, that's cool, okay? Some people, because of COVID, I understand that. I have an 85-year-old mother, and um, I just saw her two days ago. I won't see her for a couple of weeks. If I was going to see her in the next few days, I'd have a mask on when I pray for you because I'm very careful before I go to see my mother because she's 85. You know, I'm, I'm aware of that. I also know where I've been for the last few weeks, you know, I've been with my wife and I isolated in a car, you know, so I know we haven't been around anybody. And so I, I know that it's safe as far as it can be, but I also respect where people are at. And you just say, I'm not comfortable with somebody praying for me, period. I'm okay with that. But you let Jesus minister to you, okay? Now there is something, I could give you an entire teaching on the value of laying out of hands. And, uh, and there is something to impartation. 
It's in the scripture. It's there. You know, you go back and read the laws and the offerings in the book of Leviticus, and there was an impartation that took place when they laid hands. They believed that, that their sins were imparted into that sacrifice. And that when we lay hands on people, healing is imparted. Holy Spirit is imparted. More is imparted. It's what He does. Now, if that makes sense, I'm open any direction you have, Chief, but as to how you want us to pray. Just a little housekeeping here. I'd like, Pastor Don, would you take these first five chairs, just stack them as close to that speaker as you can, and if you would take these chairs and just uh, try to leave room for, for people to walk through. But that'll give us a little more room to, uh, to maneuver here. So don't, don't let that uh, take you out of the spirit of the moment. Just uh, keep focused on Jesus. You know, the Bible says we should do things decently and in order. And sometimes that's possible and sometimes that's not possible. <laughs> True. <laughs> but we'll make it as possible as we can. And we'll just let God do whatever he wants to do. Praise the Lord. So if this area fills, uh, fills up and uh, we need to move more chairs, that's okay too. But um, stay and receive the things of God. All right. All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I invite you to stand. Linda's going to sing something because that's kind of what we do. And uh, now the problem with telling people that the first two never got anything was nobody wants to be the first two. So I just go back and pray for them again. The meeting one time where somebody said, I'm not going up there yet. He said, why? He said, because I've been watching. And the longer they pray, the stronger it gets. He said, so I'm waiting a while. I said, I've got a better idea. Get prayed for two or three times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, there's no place that I'm aware of in Scripture that says that God's on a rationing system. You know, where He says, one time, that's it. You, know, you got prayed for this week, no more. You know, what I've discovered is those who are hungry. I've been, I've been in churches are seriously seven eight times a night people would stagger to the front and say lay hands on me and I've watched what God did in one of those churches I'll quit telling stories and start praying one of those churches the pastor and his wife literally were on their knees with their hands around arms around us begging us not to leave because what God had done and I knew we were done and the Spirit of God had already spoken prophetically into that place and said, I've chosen to dwell here. And I said, Pastor, there's something about your people that's attracted the attention of God. He said he's chosen to dwell here. If you don't do something stupid, he's going to be here. For the next year, he'd call me every two weeks. Every conversation began the same way. Michael, He's still here. <laughs> Years later, a friend of mine from New Zealand was speaking in his church. I had to speak to my friend because of a combined thing we were doing, and so I called him. He said, do you know where I'm at? I said, yeah, I know the town you're in. He said, no, do you know where I'm at? I said, well, yeah, you're speaking at that church. He said, no, do you know where I'm at? I said, I give up. Where are you at? He goes, I'm sitting on the front row of the auditorium with the pastor or in conversation with Michael. He is still here. I said there was something about the hunger of those people. And God said, I've got to go there. It's not a large church, never been a large church. But there was something about the hunger and God said, that is the place I've got to go to. And he stayed. So we're going to invite him. And when you want to be prayed for, I'm going to invite you to slip out from where you're at. Just come and stand somewhere. 
here at the front, and we're going to ask the Lord to come. Holy Spirit, would you come? Holy Spirit, this is your kingdom. I don't say that to be religious. I mean that. And in a day of darkness, gross darkness, you said the glory would rise upon us. Father, there is the sense of anticipation. It's not just for this moment. There's a sense of foreboding and heaviness in the hearts of many. And there's also a sense of anticipation. Father, this day, this day, would you let us stir the pot of the anticipation? This day, would you begin to release what you have promised this day. In Jesus' name. Altars open. You want to be prayed for. I invite you to come. I'm hungry so, for you. More Jesus. So hungry for He's you. Hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. So hungry for you. Oh. I'm hungry for you, Jesus. Spirit of God. So hungry for you. Spirit of God. Desperate and needy. Hear my heart's cry. Revive me with your breath of life. Don't pass me by. I'm hungry for you. Jesus. So hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. So hungry for you. I'm needing your touch. Just the touch of your hand. Shower down your sweet, sweet rain on my thirsty land. I'm hungry for you. So hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. So hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. That doesn't mean that I'm going to be 21. More of you. Touch me before. Here I am again. This is my sister. Oh, I'm hungry for more. Father, you have said to me consistently. More of you. Needing your touch. Just the touch of your hand. So, Father. Shower down your sweet, sweet rain on my thirsty land. I'm hungry for you. So hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. He couldn't so speak. hungry for you. You gave him Aaron, but then you normally spoke to Moses. Desperate and needy. Oh, how I need he said, he said, you. He said, I'm as strong now as it was then. Desperate and needy. Father, this is what Oh, needs. how I need you. So, you know what I need. Now. Desperate and needy. Oh, you know what I need. 
need more than I do, oh Jesus. I I'm hungry release. for you. Father, the promise that you have spoken. I put so myself hungry in agreement, for but I you. understand, Father. At the end of the day, this is going to be about more I'm of you. hungry for your spirit. More. More. I'm hungry more. for your peace more. and joy. More. I'm hungry for the power that changes me, that changes me. I'm hungry for more of you. Spirit of God. Hungry for you. So hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. So hungry for you. I would stir up. Now, Father, I'm really quite comfortable saying to you, you talk to me. Skip the middle man. We worship you, we worship you, we're hungry for more of you, we worship you, we give you glory, we love your way, I do have a word that we're very short, we're hungry, we're hungry, Lord, we're hungry, we're hungry, we're hungry, Lord, for more, we'll wait on you, we wait on you, that your heart desired to see, we wait on you, we wait on you. Just to let you have your way. Ha. Teach 
just to let you have your way your kingdom come your kingdom come your kingdom come and our children not for the past generations God not just for the past generations of revival but father for this generation of revival this generation of revival this, your spirit on this generation this generation this generation pour out your spirit pour out your spirit pour out your spirit pour out deliverance pour out deliverance pour out your freedom pour out an awareness of you she pour out your spirit oh lord how we need you to come how we want you to come do a new thing how we need you to come how we want you to come do more of what you do more of what you do more of what you would do Jesus he kilo romarite kila raro romana manye na rama sonde kurire di arara rama nende ye la rara mane di basho kila rama nende le di di basho kila rama sonde Every call. 